I'm delighted that we've got uh, Dr. Martin Compton from King's College London and Professor Phil Newton from Swansea University speaking here today with us. Martin is the um, programme developer lead for the college within King's College and is the, um, one of the co-leads on the Future Learn course, which is incredibly popular. And if anybody hasn't um, had a look at that course, then can I strongly recommend it because it's absolutely fantastic and really gives a nice grounding into some of the, the capabilities of AI. And Phil was my director of learning and teaching when I was at Swansea University Medical School. He's a neuroscientist by training and has some fantastic ideas and sometimes slightly controversial ideas, I think it's fair to say, Phil, about sort of the usage of some of these technologies. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what the contrast of opinions is, is between the two people. We're going to kick off with Martin for about 20 minutes and then go straight into Phil's talk, because I think they will probably uh, complement each other quite well uh, and probably answer some of the questions. Given we've got such a large audience, if you do have a question, could I ask that you please preempt the that with a, uh, a queue just so that we can identify what, what's a question? And if it's more a comment, could you just put a uh, C in front of it? And in particular, if you see uh, a question that you think is really good and you'd uh, like that to be answered, then you can upvote it so we can try and get through some of the more popular questions uh, towards the end and get as much as we can um, from this webinar. So enough from me, uh, Martin, if you're able to share your screen and um, we can kick off. Thank you. Right. Thanks ever so much, Nigel. Thanks for the invitation. Good uh, morning still in the, to colleagues. Uh, nice to see you all. Um, so, yeah, so I, I don't think I uh, want to spend too long on um, my context other than to say thanks for the, the uh, acknowledgement of the short course. I will share a link to it if people have not seen it yet it's very popular i've got um i don't know five and a half thousand participants on it it's a lot of ongoing dialogue it's, it's been really really uh, uh, popular in this space um in addition to my my actual role i've been leading across king's college on the sort of ai and education bit but um you know cards on the table i'm not talking to you as a computer scientist programmer software engineer um but as someone who is a user of an enthusiastic fiddler with and someone who's uh, a, a disciplinary expertise, originally history, now uh, very much rooted in education. Um, so I think it's important to say this, uh, but also that um, one of the really important things about this is that there's so much of this it is an undiscovered country and that um, we're all learning together. And even those with the computer science expertise need to be talking to people with disciplinary expertise all of you, and with uh, pedagogic expertise as well. So um, when Nigel invited me, he said, I want to hear your opinions. So I thought I'd frame this around my opinions, and I'm going to offer to you today six opinions, though you'll probably um, uh, probably hear a few more as we go. Um, and because there is a sort of um, biosciences aspect to it, I thought I'd start not with an opinion, but just the sharing of something, which is this uh, anatomically questionable foot that you can see here, coupled with a reputedly uh, Leonardo da Vinci, da Vinci quote, the idea of the human foot as a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. And then you go to a tool like DALI 3, an image generator, or mid-journey. I think this is a mid-journey image, which is a text-to-image generator. And you ask for a, a detailed, close-up, anatomically accurate foot, and it gives you something like this, which on the one hand is remarkable with the nails and the veins and the hairs on the big toe, and then also utterly uh, befuddling given that it's only got the four toes there. I didn't ask for only four toes. It's just that famously a lot of these image generation tools struggle with things like how many fingers on one hand, what a keyboard looks like, or what indeed a, a, a foot looks like, but presents these things back to you with confidence that this is an accurate representation. There are reasons for this. I'm not going to go into those now, but I think it really does illustrate some of the oddities in this space, probably better than some of the problems and issues in text generation, artificial intelligence tools. Um, this is much more visible, much more visceral, much more real and much more sort of in your face, if you like. 
Anyway, let's uh, let's crack on a little bit with some of these opinions. So here's opinion one to get things started. And this is around the language that's used in this space. So if I talk to my colleagues at King's from informatics, these are the computer scientists, and I start talking about um, AI or other colleagues talk about AI, they say, well, of course, of course, it's not intelligent. Or they say, well, of course, AI is much broader than what you mean with your non-expert hat on here. And I actually think that we need to get over this a little bit. When we talk in higher education or across education, it has to be said about AI, most people actually are referring to things like uh, ChatGPT or DALI or Claude AI or Copilot or Google Gemini, Bard as was, the language uh, generation tools, the natural language, the impressive results in image generation, the new, uh, really quite remarkable video from text input generation tools. This is by and large what people are talking. We, as non-specialist educators, need to be aware that artificial intelligence as a thing has been around a wee bit longer than, than that, 50, 60, 70 years maybe, where people have been talking about ways in which we can get machines to do the kind of cognitive processes that, that humans do. But we have to accept, I think, that when we talk about this in education, most people mean these kinds of tools, and we don't want to get bogged down in the language. So the first thing, first opinion is AI means what it means to people, particularly in education. And by and large, it's become synonymous with generative artificial intelligence. And the second thing about that is it's rather convenient that it's AI, because the two things that I think have been befuddling us all the most in here is what we do with assessment and what we do about academic academic integrity. So assessment innovation is another AI and academic integrity is another AI. So I think AI cubed is a really nice way of looking at these kinds of things and framing the sorts of discussions that we're having. Moving on to opinion two, this is a real challenge to what it means to be an educator, to what it means to work in higher education. Um, what I'm saying here, how you travel depends on how well you know the territory. And I've already described this space as an undiscovered country. And I think one of the things about this, the fact that we're learning as we're going, the fact that everything is liminal, the fact that everything has been disrupted and up in the air, is that we have to acknowledge that and contrast that with what we're comfortable with. We have disciplinary expertise. We are used to a very clear demarcation between us what we know, the knowledge we hold, the knowledge we impart, the ways in which we support our students to learn, and the sort of empty vessels that uh, appear before us. I mean, you might question that as a, a way of framing education. But by and large, we know our space, we know our discipline, we know where we are. Here, we're entering territory that we don't really fully understand. People are trying to shape it. We've had guidance from the Russell Group. We've got a gradual narrowing towards consensus, but there isn't consensus here. And in particular, we don't really know how fast these evolutions are going to continue and what the implications really are. And in that space of discomfort, we are really challenged as educators, as our self-concept is challenged, as the way the students perceive us is challenged. And I think we have to change the way we talk about things in our interactions with students and one another across the academy, as it were. So we have to acknowledge that this is different, that we're traveling together and actually get away from this idea of the lone wolf in the lecture hall, charismatically dealing out all of the stuff that we, that we know uh, and love passionately and accept that this is an unknown territory, that we have to voyage it together lest we uh, fall foul of the very many pitfalls. And I think this quote from Stephen Marsh, I'll share a link to the slide so you can um, click on any links that I'm sharing in here after um, after the uh, the event. But I think this says it very well, that, that there are no gatekeepers. There are no gates. The garden hasn't been built yet. We're at the very beginning and the glimpses uh, um, of its possibilities are just glimpses. Also, the glimpses of its menace and threats and um, all sorts of challenges are, are there as well. Uh, that links to a Guardian article from a series of very short essays that you can look at later.
Another quote for you, this time from Ike Gwa, who was at uh, Imperial, a computer scientist, it has to be said, who says that we've got a choice, embrace AI as an integral component uh, or um, risk obsolescence. Now, the only thing that I would challenge on, on this is the use of the word embrace. It's used a lot in these kinds of discussions. I think embrace connotes love, hugging, you know, I'm not about to put my arms around the robot and um, accept it into some kind of um, odd relationship. I will engage, but I'm holding off my hugs for now. But I do agree by and large with this that we do need to engage with these technologies and think really seriously about the implications. And more and more and more, I think that rejection of or pushing back and banning are really out of the question. Um, which leads me to opinion four. I don't know if you can see this image that's on my screen here, but basically it's uh, a meme. You might have seen it, um, uh, an exam question for maybe a GCSE student, which says find X on the hypotenuse of a triangle. You've got the two, the two other uh, ones on there and um, the two other measurements on there. And some WAG student supposedly has said, oh, here is X, I found it. And I put this into Copilot um, and uh, asked it what was happening, what does it show? Not only did it solve the problem, did the maths from the image, but it also told me it was a meme and uh, why it was humorous. And I think that that is really indicative of the way things have progressed over the last 12 months, in fact. I mean, early on, March, April, May last year, people were saying, ah, we need to give students loads of question-based um, uh, image-based questions, I'm sorry, so, th so that we can get around or make, make the uh, exams AI-proof. And of course, these technologies can read images just as well as the students can now. And that is, again, quite remarkable, but indicative of the pace of change. And that anything that anybody tells you these tech can't do, someone's working on a solution to that around the corner if it hasn't already been resolved. So I think that the idea of trying to defeat these tech, detect the tech is another thing, or AI proofing things, I think largely are, are blind alleys. But what that shouldn't mask is our efforts to really think about better assessment. And I know Phil's going to talk more about that, so I won't dwell on that now. Um, when it comes to um, uh, how we evolve our understanding, events like this are great, uh, where we can talk about this kind of stuff. What do we do with our students? What do we do with the, the hard to reach uh, colleagues? What do we do in terms of growing that AI literacy? I think a lot of people have already done quite a bit of work on defining what it is we need to do. But the key question for me is how do we do it and who's going to be responsible for that? And my fifth opinion, therefore, is that we need to put people in place in our institutions, senior level, centrally, but more importantly, champions, advocates, engagers, people at faculty or even departmental level who can take responsibility for being a foil, for innovations in assessment, for questions that colleagues have about these technologies, and really has a significant allocation of time to work with this. You can't do this on goodwill alone. We absolutely need to be investing in people as well as the huge uh, amounts of investment connoted by some of the uh, 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 technologies that are, are coming to, to the fore, such as the Office 365 version of Copilot. And by the way, another opinion for free. Why is Microsoft calling everything Copilot? Everybody is confused about it. Um, so the King's approach is linked in here. You can see our guidance that we've we've put out. You can see or listen to an AI version of all the guidance if you follow the second link here. And the short course that was mentioned by Nigel at the beginning is linked in here. And this is very much part of our process. You can see in this image here, this graphic that's uh, a representation of the approach that we've taken, multifaceted, staff and student guidance, workshops and events, the short course, funded research projects, uh, a framework that's designed to help um, various aspects of the ways in which that we encourage our colleagues to engage with uh, curriculum and assessment design and the ways in which we see our students perceiving what is the point of assessment activity. 
so on and so forth. So do have a look at those um, after this event and uh, follow the links, please. Um, a lot of people have said that they found it really useful. We put a lot of effort into it. It was a cross-institutional project. We involved staff and students, and uh, it's been through a number of iterations already. So the principles pretty much um, follow from the uh, Russell Group principles, which you may have seen, the first of which says that we absolutely have to commit to supporting staff and student literacy in this, in this space. And one of the distinctions that we're making in our conversations with academic colleagues is that it may connote teaching with uh, AI tools um, or using AI tools as part of the assessment process. But it absolutely very much is likely to also include teaching about how these technologies are impacting whatever your discipline happens to be and the kind of work and the ways in which students will be expected to work after their degrees, if not in their uh, studies at the moment. Um, at King's, like a lot of institutions, we have Microsoft. And as part of that ecosystem, we have uh, Copilot, which was Bing Chat, the browser-based language model, which is run on GPT-4 and use, uses DALI-3, but has additional guardrails in there, which in some ways are great, but in other ways quite limiting. But what's important and something that not a lot of people seem to know when I talk to them at, at King's is that that is a much better space for people to be playing around with a language model, natural language model, or an image generator, because the data is protected. What goes in, what comes out is not stored. It isn't used to, to train future iterations. So that's what we're encouraging our colleagues to use. Um, and uh, as far as other tools are used, everybody's using ChatGPT. It's no secret, but we're not ever obligating students to use that. And above all, is we're, what we're trying to do is establish a culture where we're taking a metacognitive approach to all of the activities. So if we're, if we're using these technologies, we're asking people to think about why, what's it adding, what might it be taking away, where might it be impacting the students' thinking processes and so on, and rationalizing our own usage and modeling good and effective and responsible use as we do so as well. Um, just to finish off then, a final opinion. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the time. I think I've probably got about two minutes left. Can you nod? That's right, Nigel. Yeah, great. Um, so my final opinion is that I think if we're going to really get to grips with this on an individual level, what we need to be thinking about are ways in which we can find a purpose for this, a utilisation for this, something that really helps me in my role. So. Um, here, for example, I've um, suggested 13 ways that you could use um, AI uh, broadly, but also we've got um, something that I contributed to, which is not, not mine at all, but a brilliant project, 101 Creative Uses for AI in Education. We've got the JISC National Center for Ideas, uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, for, for AI, with a load of ideas for assessment. We've got the Microsoft GitHub prompt library. Ethan Mollick has done a lot of work around this. You might have come across him. And my own collection of links and resources here, which uh, again are linked in this presentation, which I'll share in a minute. I think if you haven't started using these or, or doing anything with it, find a way that you can use it to help what you're doing, even if it's just a small thing. So for me, turning my rubbishy type notes on an article or a lecture into something a lot more coherent I can share back automating minute taking from Teams meetings, for example, or writing um, video summaries for any media production that I do, or creating thumbnails for it, the media that I produce. I found ways to introduce these technologies into my personal workflows that I absolutely know for sure have saved me significant amounts of time. It might help with aspects of marking. It might help with the ways in which you produce resources, changing media into different formats. Whatever it is, be open to the possibilities. If in particular you are feeling sceptical, anxious, worried about some of the perhaps environmental, copyright, 
data privacy impacts that, that we inevitably we have to address. At the same time, I would urge you to try and, try and balance that and think about ways in which these things are going to impact the way that we do our work. So six opinions, I think, or maybe a few more. I don't know. I'm open to questions after Phil's spoken. In the chat in a moment, I'll share a link to the presentation so that you can see all those resources. I thank you for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Martin. Always uh, inspirational to hear you speak about this. Uh, we're going to move straight on to, to Phil. Um, Phil is an academic integrity specialist. Um, and so he's going to be talking, I think, a little bit more about the assessment side of things. So, Phil, over to you. Thanks, Nigel. Um, thanks, Martin. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thanks for the introduction. I am going to focus on the impact of AI on assessment for the reasons that Nigel mentioned. This is um, something that I have done um, a reasonable amount of work on. I'd briefly just give my background. Um, my, I am a neuroscientist. My focus is on learning, memory, and cognition. My day job is teaching neuroscience to our students in the medical school here. Uh, my research is mostly focused on trying to translate that into evidence-based approaches for learning, teaching, and assessment in higher education more generally. And one of the first projects I did on that was on cheating, it was on do students know what cheating is when they're being accused of it, what does it actually mean? And from there, I have ended up doing many years worth of work on um, academic integrity, the positive side of this question, and cheating, the negative side of it. So I'm really going to focus on that. Um, and in particular, I am going to focus on what the evidence says about what the potential impact is of AI on assessment, in part because this is my area of, of evidence-based practice, and also because um, Nigel introduced me as having controversial opinions, and I'm going to try and avoid my opinions and focus mostly on what the evidence actually says. Um, I will say at the beginning, though, I think one of the punchlines from this is we don't have enough evidence about what these tools can do, even though they are um, impacting our daily lives as well as our educational practice. We really do need more rigorous peer-reviewed research on these tools. Uh, and also, I think it's important to say that um, professional opinion and personal opinion are valid forms of evidence, especially given the, form, the, the speed with which these tools are developing. I'm going to briefly just highlight why I think this is existentially important for us and why assessment is important. As universities, as a higher education sector, we obviously do a lot of things. But the thing that defines us, according to the people that define us, is our assessments. We are defined very literally as an organization with degree awarding powers as a university by um, what uh, was our regulator. I can never be quite sure whether it is or it isn't anymore. But certainly, in general, a, a definition of a university is that it does lots of important things, but the thing that sets it apart from other education or, or um, student support services type providers is that it can award a degree. Our degree is our certification to society that our graduates can do a particular set of things to a particular standard at this particular time. It's our certification of their learning. And that certification is made on the basis of our assessments, which are our measure of their ability to do that. If we get assessment wrong, then everything else is, becomes problematic after that. What makes a good assessment is something that we can spend many hours talking about, but the summary of it is almost always that it's a measure of what someone can actually do. And what we're looking at when we're designing an assessment, when we're asking our students to do an assessment, is observing them hopefully doing something. We use very many proxies for that. Um, and there are very many different typologies and taxonomies of what assessments are. I've ripped this one off from the fantastic Phil Race from his Lecturer's Toolkit book. And it's just a simple summary of some of the things that students do when we assess them. And we might ask them to answer multiple choice questions, and we often do this in the form of exams. We might ask them to write, and we might do that in the form of dissertations and in um, uh, uh, essays and so on. We might ask them to give a presentation in the form of a talk uh, or in a poster or something like that. We might ask them to do a practical skill, very relevant for this audience, in the form of a lab um, do, do a lab demonstration or, or undertake a lab task or a clinical task or we might ask them to give a performance um, do some sort of artistic task we often get them to do their own research in the form of research projects capstone projects etc we often 
but not as often as our European colleagues make use of the form of assessment that is the oral viva. In the UK, we most commonly use this in the form of a thesis defense. Uh, I am reliably informed that this is used much more commonly in undergraduates, for undergraduates um, in other countries. And then we often have workplace-based assessments um, where we might get students to do an assessment in, in the workplace or we might get a rating from their mentor or something like that. Apologies if your favorite type of assessment isn't fully captured here, but these are some of the most common ones that we do. The problem for us then is just as Martin said, and he's uh, saved me a job, is that um, on November the 30th, 2022, I think everything changed. Um, we talk about AI. It can mean lots of things. AI experts are quite grumpy about the fact that all of us are suddenly interested in a specific type of AI. But I completely agree with Martin that for our purposes, AI means generative AI. And in particular, the research, the evidence is mostly on ChatGPT, recognizing that there are many other um, tools as well. And the fundamental challenge as far as I can see from an assessment perspective, is that a good assessment is a measure of what a student can do. And the problem for us now becomes who is doing the doing. Is the student doing it? Is the technology doing it? Or is it some combination of those things? And I'm going to work through three different examples that talk about um, three different situations with a combination of the student and the technology doing the assessment task. Um, I will pause a second just to explain this image because um, it took me a really, really long time to make this image. Um, and it's still terrible for the reasons that I think are nevertheless important. What I asked uh, Dali via ChatGPT to do was to generate an image of a student and an Android sitting next to each other completing an assignment in a university setting. And I asked it, dozens of different ways. And in each case, I asked it for the, the student and the Android to have no, obs, um, no visible and observable ethnicity and to be gender neutral. And I did that, like I said, multiple times. And every single time, the Android was female. I don't know why. Um, if you want me to show you the hundreds of pictures, I can. But it was every single time. The student was mostly male, although they did a bit of a better job um, of producing gender neutral images there. And even though I asked it for it not to have any observable ethnicity, um, and to the extent that I asked it to make them blue, in almost all cases, it was white people whose skin was made blue. And there are very many examples of bias within these tools, um, many of them well documented. I had never seen this one before, and it is just one that uh, is obvious, but I think tells us that there's lots of things going on that are maybe not as obvious, and we always have to be aware of these challenges. The question for us then is who's doing the doing, and the, whether it's the student, whether it's the robot, the technology, or whether it's some combination of those. And I want to start by just talking about an example where only the technology is doing the assignment. And that um, the most research on that, at least that I'm aware of, comes from this particular form of assessment, which is the multiple choice question. We have finally just finished a paper on this, um, which is a review. There's been so much research, even in the short period of time, that we're able to write a review. And the review is of studies which have very basically taken some form of standardized MCQ-based exam, fed it into ChatGPT, and seen how well ChatGPT does in terms of getting the questions right, in terms of how well it scores compared to humans and compared to the pass mark. Summarized very quickly, we found 53 studies. We stopped looking in July last year, and there have been very many more since. These studies covered 49,000 different assessment items from a variety of different disciplines, although most of them are in medicine, as you'll see. And just to give you a punchline and to make an important point, um, some of the studies, all of the studies really, almost all of them used the free version of ChatGPT, which currently runs a GPT called GPT 3.5. Um, prior to that, had used GPT 3. There is a subscription version, as many of you will know, uh, which runs GPT 4. The free version of ChatGPT got 54% of these exam questions correct. The subscription version got 75% of them correct. And I spent a lot of time looking at different interventions in education, looking at the effect size of those, and nothing comes close to the size of the difference between these two things. Essentially, what this means then is a student who had no knowledge whatsoever of these questions was able to access GPT-4 during an exam with score 75%. I'm going to show you a bit more detail before talking about the implications of that. 
These are some of the exams from medicine. Our medical students do a lot of assessments. They do exams to get into medical school. They do exams to graduate from medical school, to become licensed doctors. And then when they're becoming um, consultants, they do specialty exams as well. The free version of ChatGPT can just about get into medical school. It can just about graduate medical school in most countries. But once we get to the specialty exams, um, it really struggles. If, however, we look at the subscription version of ChatGPT with GPT-4, it passes everything. Um, many of these studies didn't test GPT-4, but if we assume that if GPT-3 can pass or 3.5 can pass and GPT-4 can pass, then you can see it's this clean sweep. Um, and the subscription version of ChatGPT could basically pass any form of MCQ-based exam in medicine. These include exams where novel questions are written for the exam and where various different measures are made of whether or not the questions themselves are in the training materials for the technology. Those questions aren't done very well, it has to be said, but where they are done, it seems pretty clear that um, ChatGPT can pass even novel questions, ones that it hasn't seen before. Um, we have a saying in English that something is difficult, um, or sorry, something is easy, a subject is easy if it's not rocket science or it's not brain surgery. And you can see here in the middle of the slide that postgraduate specialty exams in neurosurgery, brain surgery, chat GPT can pass, i.e. the thing that we define as one of the most difficult subjects that there is. Um, this is important. Um, for a number of reasons. An, obvi an obvious response to this is to say, well, when we do MCQ-based exams, we have invigilators are done in person. There's people monitoring the security of these. And, and that is true in many cases. But during COVID, we all switched very quickly to online exams. And many of us did that in an unproctored format. I, the students were not observed. They were just asked to do this online. And since COVID, I think many of us have seen that there's a great advantage to allowing students to do exams online. Um, benefits for them, benefits for us. And so many people have wanted to carry on doing that to the extent that there was this paper in PNAS not very long ago, which argued that unproctored online exams provide a meaningful assessment of student learning. So even those of us who think that this is a, an insecure form of assessment, we must be aware that there are very many people who think this is a very good thing to do. Um, I think this is flawed, um, in part, so much so that I managed to write back to PNAS and they published my response, uh, and then not least because it ignores some of the basic literature on students cheating, which is that students are much more likely to cheat if it's easy for them to do and if it makes an observable difference to how well they do in an assessment. And as you've just seen, ChatGPT can give them a really good score, and if they're in an unproctored online setting, they're going to be able to access ChatGPT and use it to complete their exams. Another response to this then is to say, well, we just use these things, these cameras built into uh, our computers. We can keep our online exams, but we can monitor students um, using these technologies. This is a whole other question, uh, but I do think it is worth just acknowledging that students, when we've reviewed this, which we've just done, really don't like these technologies. And I mean, really, really don't like these technologies. They're concerned about their privacy, about whether the, the technology is accurate and fair fair to them on the basis of their demographic characteristics. They're concerned about whether their technology is able to match with it. It does seem that these technologies reduce cheating and students are accepting of the need for these tools if they are going to do online exams, but they really, really have a miserable time doing it. Um, and then there is a related question about many of the challenges with these tools is that they have AI built into them to try and detect whether or not students are cheating. And so to try and deal with the challenges of one form of AI, we're potentially just re refreshing it, battling it against a different form of AI. And I, I think this is a race to the bottom, really. Um, I don't know what the answer to this is. I don't think any of us really want to do lots and lots of in-person face-to-face exams um, in, old, in exam halls, but I don't know what the alternative is. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can have a discussion about that shortly. One proposed solution, um, and the final thing I'll talk about is, all right, well, if ChatGPT can answer these questions, why are you getting students to answer them in the first place? Why are we doing these MCQ-based exams? Why are we doing these, um, these knowledge tests? Um, there's a lot that we could talk about here and some examples we could give. We don't have a huge amount of time, so I'll simply summarize them by referring to the work of the great Dan Willingham and saying that basic knowledge is really important. We cannot get our students to this 
higher level of learning that we want where they're critically appraising topics unless they know the basic facts. And that's possibly more important in STEM even than it is in anything else. Um, we are used to looking at things like Bloom's taxonomy, um, very, very many problems with these sorts of hierarchies of learning. But at the end of the day, there is something fundamentally true about the fact, and this is where I'm able to finally bring in a bit of neuroscience, that learning is hierarchical. We can't do this higher order critical thinking unless we know the basic facts. And a simple example of this is that all of the world's knowledge is in my phone, it's in your phone as well. All the knowledge that's necessary, all the facts that are needed to be a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer are in your phone, but that doesn't make us a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer because having the basic knowledge is what we need to be able to know what to ask ChatGPT or to put into one of these tools. And so we really do need to make sure that students are supported to achieve this foundational knowledge. At the moment, the best way that we do that is with basic old-fashioned exams, and I don't know what a, an effective alternative is. This actually is the final thing I will say. Apologies, I, I, I said I was going to say the final thing just now, and this is the final thing I'll talk about. Um, and this is the thing that I think most of us were worried about when ChatGPT first came out because it's generate, designed to generate text. People were very worried that it could write essays. There has been quite a lot of research on this. ChatGPT does write pretty good essays. And where this has been tested in a blind format, the essays, when they're marked by human authors who don't know who's written it, sorry, by human markers who don't know who's written it, they give higher scores to ChatGPT written essays than to human authors. It's important to say, though, that this is unreferenced academic text. It's not a three or 4,000 word essay. And I can't find <clears throat> a study that's actually looked at that. When we ask human markers to tell whose work is who, the peer-reviewed research claims that markers cannot really distinguish. I suspect that now those of us who spent a lot of time with this, if we did these experiments again, we might actually be able to tell because it has become more familiar. Some of the studies we reviewed in our MCQ-based paper also included essays, and in general, where ChatGPT had been tested on MCQs and essays, it did better on essays than it did in MCQs. And when doing academic writing, again, the paid-for version was better than the free version. One of the things that we comforted ourselves with when this first happened was that ChatGPT could write okay, but when we asked it to give some references for the things that it had written, it would hallucin hallucinate those. In general, it seems that it does not do that anymore. And in particular, the better version of the tool that you're using, the less likely it is to hallucinate references. And um, I'll show a little bit of examples of that in a second. It struggles still to format the academic writing. And the quality of the reference isn't always the best, although it's often pretty good. Um, but it generally tends to, ref to rec recommend references that are real. If a student were to go and look for an AI essay writer, like they used to do a few years ago and look for a contract cheating service, they would find dozens and dozens of them. Most of these are not very good. Some of them are pretty good. And I've spent quite a lot of time with some of them. The ones that I've spent most of the time with um, are the ones that you can now access directly through ChatGPT using these custom GPTs um, that, were, that were made available for us to build just a few weeks ago. And if you go into the custom GPTs and you search for essay, you will find some. In fact, you will find lots. Um, some of them are pretty good. Some of them are pretty bad. Some of them are really very good. And with a little bit of tweaking, we'll write a fairly passable looking essay. Although, again, we don't have a lot of peer reviewed research on this. An obvious response to this then is to say, all right, well, we'll just use these AI detection tools. And there has been some research on these. I think it's really important to be clear what this research says. Um, a lot of us read that these tools don't work. That's not really true. They do work pretty well. And in particular, the sort of error that we really would not want them to make, which is to falsely accuse a student's work of being written by AI, those errors are actually pretty rare. The problem for us is, and this is recognized in at least these two papers by these fabulous groups of people, is that in this case, when you use these tools, you don't have any other forms of independent evidence. So when we used to use Turnitin, and we still do, Turnitin would say there's a 56% match to this particular Wikipedia page. You go to the Wikipedia page, there's your basis for your conversation with a student about who's done this. With these tools, even though their accuracy is pretty good, if their error rate is only 1% or 0.5%, that's still a lot of students who will be unfairly accused, and you don't have anything else really to go on. 
other than maybe to do a viva of the students. And if that's a valid assessment, we probably should have done that in the first place. That leads me on then to the final thing I will say, which is to consider the situation where the students and the technology are working together. And here is where I really, I really, really don't know where this is all going to end up. If we look at an old-fashioned definition of plagiarism, it's old-fashioned even though it's from just a few months ago, it's the act of using someone else's work or ideas without giving them proper credit. All of our definitions, or most of them for plagiarism, don't consider work that's not written by humans, and I really don't know how this ends up. And here is an example from a recent report from HEPI, which some of you may have seen, which posed students uh, a question a student is preparing an essay. They use ChatGPT to generate a draft of the essay, which they then edit before submitting. Have they cheated when they do that? I don't know. Do we want them not to do this? I don't think so. It could be quite useful. Where, does, where do we draw the line? Where is the student's work and where is not? Give you a more sophisticated example. A student uses ChatGPT to generate an outline of the essay with key subheadings to identify 15 key references. The student then writes the essay using these headings and references. And when I've tested out these essay writing tools, they all do this. And honestly, they do a pretty good job of this. I think this is actually a really helpful thing for students to do. But if the chat GPT is selecting the references, and that's a part of critical appraisal and essay writing, whose work is it? Whose judgment is it? I don't know. I really don't know. And I don't know where we go with this to try and identify a route which helps students which allows them to get the best out of these tools, but still allows us to certify their learning in the way that I talked about at the beginning. And for many of us, when we see these sorts of scenarios, we say, well, it depends what's the student supposed to do, what's the essay on, how long have they got to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And that, I think, is where we need to focus our detail, but it's going to make it really hard to generate basic policy that defines what students can and can't do, what's good and bad to help them and not, and so on. Final slide then, there are many unanswered questions. I've talked about ChatGPT. There are many other tools um, every week, it seems there's a new one that claims to be better than GPT-4. We've talked about essays and MCQs. We know that these tools can generate PowerPoints. We know that they can generate scripts for presentations. Are they good? Are they bad? Are they indifferent? What's the evidence say? We don't actually know whether students are using AI to cheat. Given everything we know about cheating, now my suspicion is they probably are. There was a pretty good study that came out last week from Vietnam showing that about 29% um, of undergraduates said that they were using it specifically to cheat, and that was the wording that was used. But we don't actually know what cheating means, and I suspect the students don't and the staff don't, which is going to make it hard actually to do these experiments. And then I think there's a related question, which is that when I have given these sorts of talks in other countries, they have got to the end and, and I've smiled politely and said, well, this is really a British problem or an American problem. We don't use essays. We don't use asynchronous assessments. We use oral vivas. We use exams. I don't know actually what the, the data are on the balance of different assessment types in different programs and countries. And I would love if someone could hold my hand and point me in the right direction. I think that we can learn a lot from people who are using different assessment methods. Uh, I recognize I have now gone on too long, so I'll stop. Uh, we can circulate these slides. There are some of the references that I have referred to. Um, any questions that we can't answer here, this is my email address, and uh, I'd be love to talk to you some more about all of these things. So I will stop sharing and hand back to my hosts. Brilliant. Thank you much, Phil. Really insightful, as always. Um, we've had some sort of quite broad themes of questions that have emerged through the chat that David's been keeping an eye on and helped summarise. Um, so what I'm going to is try and get your opinions on both of the uh, from David uh, from Phil and Martin. Um, so what are the better ways of assessing students using AI, and what are the potential pitfalls? Now you've touched on that already a little bit, Phil. But Martin, have you got any thoughts about about that question? I mean, yeah. I mean, we're we're, we're finding our feet. Um, one thing I would say, though, I think Phil's point about definition of cheating is a really important one. It's very easy to make headline grabbing bits of uh, uh, studies here, studies there. Twenty nine percent of students are cheating. But if there's no agreed uh, notion of what cheating is at, right at the forefront and, you you know, you, you stick a dozen academics in a room and you'll get 12 different views on what what is and what isn't cheating. That's why those. Those little vignettes are really useful to put in front of people because we realise that actually we haven't had consensus for donkey's years. You know, this is why people come to me and say, so, you know, 
what is an okay percent in turn it in for uh, on the plagiarism checker or the similarity checker in fact and you know if we're talking at that level of unsophistication around understanding what a uh, um a uh, similarity checker does then we've got no hope in <laughs> defining uh, in all its complexity what uh what what cheating is and i think that you know we actually really need to start interrogating what we define as cheating because there are cultural differences in the ways in which people approach these things the you know we just because english is the dominant language of global scientific publication and even education it doesn't mean that it will always be thus and it doesn't mean that actually we should then put a flag in the sand and say our definition of cheating is the one that should hold true forever and a day so i think that that point that phil made is is fundamental in this space but answering your question specifically i think medical education offers us a lot in terms of some of the positive ways of doing things so i was at recently um joined kings from ucl and when I was at UCL, I, I went and observed, had the privilege of observing uh, pharmacy OSCEs. That's the structured um, clinical examinations, which are in person, uh, effectively oral assessments, where students have five different assessments in uh, in one day. And they were processing between two and 300 students in a day. It was a buzz. It was exciting. It was energizing. Not only were they being assessed, but the feedback was being produced and they were getting the outcomes at the end of that day. So when someone says that interactive oral is not scalable, I would point them to that example and say, actually, I think sometimes we're just limited by our imagination and experience. So that would be one thing that I would do. And the other the final thing I would say on this um, is that I'm very, very nervous about structuring these conversations around words like cheating, about the assumption that students will cheat. Um, students have always cheated, according to whatever your definition of cheating is. I think it's been a massive elephant in the room for a very long time. And thank you, ChatGPT, for surfacing these conversations about assessment and integrity. But I really don't think that that should be our starting point, the assumption that students are going to cheat. Most of the students I talk to are really nervous about this. Some of them are really resentful that there is the potential for other students in their group, imaginary students, to do to do the cheating. Um, I think students will not cheat or do things that are inappropriate when the assessments are valid, worthwhile, developmental, interesting and engaging. But if we're giving them busy work, repetitive work or what appears to be valueless assessment, I'm not surprised people cut corners. Long answer, sorry, multiple questions answered there as well. Yeah, have you got anything to come back on with, with that? Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I I think um I mean agree with all of that. I think in terms of cheating, I agree we my perspective on this is something I've worked on for a long time. This is why um it perhaps is the emphasis of my work. And a lot of the things we discover is that students are under a huge numbers of pressures um, and many of them will cheat if a variety of factors are satisfied the likelihood of that goes up and one of them is making it easy making it successful not caring about the assessment um, making the assessment seem meaningless etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I do want to just look at I, I can see from some of the comments and the questions there are lots of things um, there are lots of questions which I think is great um, there are lots of things that we would have covered if we'd had two hours to talk um, but we don't. Um, in terms of the MCQs, there's lots of questions about the level of those MCQs and the fact that they have a right and wrong answer. It is, I think, reasonable to say that um, these tools will find it easier to answer so-called knowledge and understanding MCQs. But the postgraduate specialty exams, in particular in medicine and the medical licensing exams, these are very, very hard questions. Um, they're at a very high level. They they are designed to allow people to become some of the most qualified and high risk specialists in the world, neurosurgeons, cancer specialists, and so on. So they're not factual recall. They're genuinely solving complex clinical problems. Um, the fact that they have a right and wrong answer, I think, is important, um, uh, as, as Dave mentioned. But, and I think. I think also that's important is the fact that they do often use complex esoteric terminology, which tells us a lot about the importance of students learning that technology, uh, so learning that terminology, sorry, and learning what the basic facts mean so that they can get the best out of these tools. But that perhaps does also allow the tools to find, to navigate their way to the correct answer. Uh, but the short answer is that these are 
these are not easy questions. It's some of them. Some of the older papers recommended that um, writing high-level MCQs was the best way to, to cheat-proof them against ChatGPT. I wrote a paper all about that, which ChatGPT smashed to smithereens because no matter how hard we made the questions, it can answer them. Thanks, Phil. Uh, there's been a consensus question that's come through. There's a lot of people who seem to be quite interested in this. Is, is there a, a sector-wide approach to, to AI in education? And if so, who should be leading it? Phil, I'm going to hand that very hard question over to you to start with. I don't think there is a consensus. I think in large part because there are lots of people, most of whom aren't here, who have no idea really that this is going on, but they know that the people like us are frantically jumping up and down and talking about it and that they hear about it in the news. But uh, many of us will have had the experience of giving a presentation and asking participants, do you, do you use ChatGPT? And, and they don't. Um, so you've got people who have no idea really or very little idea what these tools can do through to people who've spent much of their professional career in the last year looking at it. So I think it's very difficult to expect there is consensus. I do think that we need a stronger guidance from the people who regulate higher education. In higher education, particularly in the UK, we don't have a great track record of rapid innovation. Um, it's a gentle way of saying it, I think. Um, we, we did it in COVID because we had to, but other than that, we, we're not great at it. Um, and I think we need a steer from from government, really, to say that we need to take these issues seriously. Uh, but at the same time, I wouldn't want anyone telling us how to get the best out of these tools because I don't think anyone knows what that means yet. And I think we will get the best out of our very smart people in universities if they're given the freedom to innovate and experiment and and come up with some suggestions, as Martin has done and others have done, for how best how to get the best out of them. So it's my long-winded way of saying I don't know, but we do need a, a firm steer. Thanks, Phil. Martin? Yeah, just, um, I, I mean, I broadly agree with that, but I think that we are funneling towards a broad consensus. You know, it wasn't so long ago where um, several high-profile institutions were saying they banned the use of ChatGPT amongst students. And I, I, I think you'd be hard pushed to find an institution level where that is the case, in England at least. Um, whereas, you know, I know of different departments in my own institution who are more tentative, whilst others sit next door in the same room sometimes, uh, who are much more engaged. So, you know, there, there are differences and it depends very much on the parties involved. I think Bill's point about leadership, but particularly about senior leadership, is really important. But one phenomenon that I have noticed, and I asked that question all the time in all the events that I do with both students and with staff is, you know, have you touched this stuff, dipped your toes in the water, found a, found a, a thing, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, initially there was that classic uh, normal distribution. Um, I'm sensing a shift towards more engagement and use, whereas probably this time last year you were getting well over half half the people in any given space, in any given context, saying they haven't really used any of these technologies, that's down to about 15 20% by and large now in, in most of these things. So gradually we're seeing incremental use. It's probably not moving fast enough, given the, the rapidity of evolution and development. But um, with that experience comes a much better understanding. Somebody said in the chat, I don't know who it was, sorry, I can't name you, that um, people pontificate about these things, I'm paraphrasing, uh, about these things without ever having had direct exposure. And that's dangerous, you know, having opinions about things. This is why I, I started my presentation by saying I am not a computer scientist. Uh, you know, I know where my limitations are to an extent. And I want to share those with people because we are in, in this kind of space. So, so I think we are moving towards a broad consensus of engagement at the very least. The funded research that we're doing at King's is being mirrored by research projects uh, all over the place. But we, but we remain with those issues about they've come up in the chat very, very well about what do we what do we want from assessment? What do we want from our students? What's the point of a blooming degree? And, you know, if this disruption is causing us to ask fundamental questions about the purpose of education, then let that be a good thing that comes out of this. I think a quite nice little follow-up question from that is that 
do you think that we should be starting to think about the use of AI at societal level? I mean, what is acceptable and what it means, you know, an, an, on an ethical basis to use AI? Um, is that something that we should be looking at as well? I think we have to discuss all of these things with our students and our colleagues in particular. Um, but but we're not going to – we can respond and react to the realities of what society is throwing at us. We've got a couple of big elections coming up this year, one, one in uh, – <laughs> in the UK and one in the, in the States, and both of them are going to be impacted heavily by um, uh, propaganda using AI deepfakes and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, we need to be talking about this and surfacing it. I, I've made a video where I apparently speak five different languages, one after the other, and pe people have said to me, didn't know you could speak all those languages. Of course, I can't speak all of those languages. But even me, with my limited technical skill, is able to produce something that gives the impression that I can speak multiple languages. That is the kind of literacy we need to be surfacing. And then the implications in terms of teaching and learning. So all the stuff that's happening in society, we need to reflect back through dialogue, discussion, debate, openness, but also think about the implications for, for teaching and learning simultaneously, I think. Do you have any thoughts on that? Exactly, completely agree. Uh, uh, this is an issue that's bigger than assessment and academic integrity and probably even bigger than higher education. I've also made videos of me speaking French and Hindi and Greek and Portuguese and I'm absolutely astonished um, at just how good they are and they were free and they took seconds and those technologies are have got better since I did that just a few months ago. And um, I, I, I cannot pretend to know what the answers are. Like Martin, I'm not a computer scientist or an AI expert. I think that, however, is part of I'm the problem. Not... We're um the sort the number of people who would know how these tools work to the extent that they could build their own is vanishingly small. Many of us can tell convincing stories about neural networks and back propagation and image diffusion and so on, but ultimately when it comes down to it i don't know how these tools work and the vast majority of humanity doesn't either and that i think is is problematic for us for some various obvious reasons particularly 2024 when uh, many countries are going to exercise their democratic rights and these tools are going to have a profound influence on them and that's probably an even bigger question than the ones we're talking about today yeah we've got plenty of time just for, for one more question i apologize we're not going to get through all the questions in the chat there's far too many uh, but something that came up when you were speaking, Phil, is that um, how are medical schools preparing students to use AI in their working lives? So how's AI going to be incorporated into medicine, do you think? I think it was I think, the diagnostic side of things. I think, I think the answer to that is probably the same as it is for all disciplines. In the, the students, when we talk to them, and Myra Ziramiti, Maritu did the project with them as a medical student, her and her colleagues, they desperately want us to help them with this because they want to go into the world of work prepared. But I think we don't know what that looks like yet. I don't think anyone could confidently say medics can effectively use AI to diagnose these particular conditions or to work on these communication skills or, to, or to, to prescribe and so on. I think it's still working itself out. And I'm hopeful that all vocational um, qualifications are led by what the workforce and the sector needs. And so hopefully we will get the answers from um from the workforce from the sector soon because i suspect they're going to find out very quickly i would also just like in, in the seconds we have just to, to second martin's enthusiasm for the oski i have always championed the oski as a fantastic assessment even in the days of sa mills and contract cheating and i really think it's a fantastic way of assessing students not without its own problems but it really is the, the assessment that tells us most about the students and prepares them the best i think brilliant thanks phil uh, we have just reached 12 o'clock, um, so I'm just going to take this opportunity to just say thank you very much for your time to come and, and listen to these talks. Phil, Martin, thank you very much for giving up your time and for sharing your opinions and expertise. It's been fascinating. I will get a recording of this video up onto my YouTube channel so people will be able to watch it back. And there's been numerous requests for the chat to be shared as well as part of that. So hopefully we can keep the conversation going. Uh, and we will look to arrange some future sessions in, um, as well to sort of as, as this field is so rapidly evolving uh, and we'll be able to sort of have some more webinars and hopefully share some um, other perspectives as well. But so thank you very much for, for coming and um, see you next time.